So I'm going right to my text. I'll make sure that we're still out of here on time. Uh, and it's coming from the Gospel of St. Mark, the 15th chapter, where Jesus is on his way to the cross after being tried by the Roman governor, Roman procurator, uh, Pilate. So in Mark chapter 15, and I'm reading for those who are sharing on television with me, the 21st verse, Mark 15. A certain man from Cyrene, Simon, the father of Alexander and Rufus, was passing by on his way in from the country, and they forced him to carry the cross. They brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. Then they offered him wine mixed with mirror, but he did not take it. And they crucified him, dividing up his clothes. They cast lots to see what each would get. It was nine in the morning when they crucified him. The written notice of the charge against him read, the king of the Jews. And all of God's people sat. And for those of you sharing on television, thank you again for being with me almost every week. Uh, my subject today is carrying the burden of others. I knew somebody was going to say preach on a subject like that. I said carrying the burdens of others. Uh, don't you feel the spirit in this before I even say anything? So let someone say, Holy Ghost, talk to me, Holy Ghost. And Holy Ghost, talk to someone I'm carrying the burden for too. Talk to them too, Holy Ghost. As God, the Christ needed nothing from man. He even said in the word of God in Psalms, he says, if I need anything from you, I wouldn't even ask you. But remember, Jesus Christ, all God, and at the same time, all so I don't know you follow. He was also all man. And as a man, he needed help to carry the very cross that he was getting ready to be crucified upon. He needed help to get it to Golgotha, the place of the skull, just outside Jerusalem because they did not crucify people in Jerusalem. Most of you here today and sharing with me on television, know what it feels like to be exhausted. And I'm learning something, turned 67 on yesterday. I'm learning something. <laughs> and I do again want to thank all of you for your cards, telephones. I had all kind of faces. I'm not on Facebook because I'm, I, I, my daughter said, will you look at all this? I, hundreds of people just wishing me happy birthday. Thank you so much. But I'm learning something. As I get older, I get tired faster. I know how some of you are. I'm still the kid. No, you the old kid. <laughs> you got to get your rest. And, and, and even young people get exhausted. It's a very fast-paced world in which we live today. But I'm here to tell you, no matter how you get exhausted, it does not even begin to compare to the 15 hours of continuous Continuous suffering that Jesus Christ had just endured in my text verses. Look at all that Jesus had endured. I summarized it. He had been in the last 15 hours betrayed by one of his disciples, Judas. He had suffered the agonies of the Garden of Gethsemane where he prayed three times for the cup of death to pass, asking the Father, can you find some other way than for me to go to the cross and be separated from you. Because I've been in the bosom of the Father forever. Now i got to go to the cross because sin separates us from God. Jesus endured the desertion by his own disciples. He endured the torture of, of a hypocritical trial by the religious leaders called the Sanhedrin. He endured being mocked by the high priest Caiaphas. And his Closest disciple, if we can use that term, I know talk about John being the one closest, but Peter was incredibly close. Peter, the one who swore up and down, I'll never leave you, all these other disciples leave you, but not me. Even Peter deserted him. He had to deal with a trial by the unjust judge Pilate. Terrible ordeal of being scourged. Face swollen from slaps. Back lacerated. 
by Roman soldiers with a whip that literally pulled the flesh out of him. And people want to be saved by works after all Jesus done went through. I'm sorry, I got to get off that. Unbearable pain. Now you understand the reason he had to have help and why he could not go any further. Who is this Simon? Forced by Roman soldiers to help Jesus carry his cross. Simon was a Cyrenian from Cyrene, which is modern day Egypt. Many Bible scholars believe he was a proselyte to the Jewish faith. It is believed he was returning home after celebrating the Passover. By taking up Jesus' cross, this black Jew became the first person to fulfill the requirements that Jesus gives us in Matthew 16 and 24, which I'm reading now. Before he went to the cross, Jesus said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must what? Deny themselves, take up their cross, and what? The first one to do that is a black man. The first lesson we learn from this story of Simon carrying Jesus' cross, and for those who are guests, we do hashtags throughout the sermon that you can use your phone, take a picture of, and send them out, and they go out by the hundreds every week. It's a form of witness and testimony. This first hashtag says, to help others, you often have to change your plans. I'm going to get a couple old school saints that go like this. You know you're right. <laughs> to help others, you often have to change your plans. Simon was minding his own business. On his way home, and he is not asked, he's forced into this service. Now he must help carry Jesus' cross, someone else's burden. Oh, I'm going to get all up in y'all houses today. <laughs> Tell your neighbor, say, been there, done that. <laughs> or am there doing that now. <laughs> Come on and help a pastor out up in here. The Bible teaches really that there are three types of burdens that are weights or pressures in life. Uh, the first is a person having to bear their own burden. The Bible gives us that in Galatians chapter 6 verse 5. And as those of you who are watching on television, you know already I'm very biblical in what I bring. I don't bring you a lot of conjecture. I go to the word. Now note what Paul says in Galatians 6 and 5. He says, each one should what? Carry their what? There's some things in life, no matter how much you want to, you have to share it and deal with it yourself. All of us know it. I'm just stating what you already know. As a parent, I know what it means for our children to be sick. And to watch them being sick and wish, I, or my wife and I wish, we could take their place. And especially when they're really young and can't talk, and you don't really know that they're having an ear infection or what's going on with them. You wish you could take their place, but you can't. You can pray for them. You can take them to the doctor, but they got to get through it. Not only that, no one can make your decisions for you outside, of course, like a power of attorney. You, you have a right to make your choices, a right to make your decisions. No one can have faith in God for you. A few hours earlier, Jesus pleaded three times to his father not to have to go to the cross. But you and I both know no one could save our souls from sin except Jesus. There was no substitute you could get to go to the cross for Jesus. He had to do it because 
The wages of sin is death. So I don't care how hard you try to keep the law, you're going to come up way short. And Jesus was the sinless lamb of God, no human being. Not Adam, not Moses, not Abraham, not to, no human being could go in the place of you to Calvary to pay the cost for your sins. And that's why I'll praise him and I'll serve him till I die. He did for me what no one else could do for me. And the same goes for you. The second type of burden is when a person bears the burdens of others. The Bible is clear on our responsibility to help others. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 14. The apostle writes, And we urge you, brothers and sisters, to do what? Warn those who are idle and disruptive. Encourage the disheartened. And do what? Help the weak. Be patient with everyone. Note what Romans 15 and 1 says. It says, We who are strong, ought to bear the weakness or the failings on the weak and not to please ourselves. You see, the spiritually mature person should never view themselves as too good to help others. Because when you become too good to help others, you have become self-righteous. Note again Galatians chapter 6 verses 1 through 3 as Paul addresses that very concept. Brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently. You shouldn't be going around talking about you fool, you idiot. Then he tells us why. But watch yourselves or you also may be tempted. Because sometimes when you criticize others, and their weakness and their failing, give it a few months, give it a few years, sometimes you end up in the same mess, in the same craziness that they in. Then he goes on and says, carry what? Each other, say it again, carry each other's burden. Carry each other's burden. And in this way, you fulfill the law of Christ, which talks about us having love one to another. This was the problem with the religious leaders of Jesus' day. They were always condemning and judging others, but never themselves. I've noticed that some of the most judgmental people I've ever met have nothing ever to say about themselves. There are some people, they done went and prayed for everybody except themselves. Because they don't have no need. They perfect. I think a part of being spiritually mature is to understand that we all in this thing called humanity together. That we all are weak. That we all mess up from time to time. And the church ought to be the place, not only where you can get cleansed from sin, but you can be the place where people help you lift the load and help you carry what they can do. I want you to know Matthew chapter 7, again, the religious leaders. These are the words of Jesus very quickly. He said, don't judge, make un, un, rash, harsh judge. We all make judgments. You have to judge what clothes you're going to wear today. But these are the harsh, critical, biased judgments that Jesus is dealing with. He says, for in the same way you judge others, and I did not just say it, in the same way you judge others, you're going to be judged. And with the same measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eyes and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when all the time there's a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite. Take the plank out of your own eye. Then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. I brought with me some, this is some sawdust in here. Let me see if I can get a little of it out. And as I was reading, preparing my sermon, something hit me. See, there's the sawdust. Now, some 
translations say it's like a splinter. But, you know, you're going to go to the eye doctor if you got this baby. up in you. <laughs> If you got something like this. But most of us have, how many have had something in their eye? What is amazing to me that I never thought about, that Jesus said, first take the sawdust out of your eye. How is it that they didn't know they had sawdust in their eye? The smallest thing irritates your eye. You, it, you'll be telling somebody, do you see it? Do, they don't see nothing, but you feel it. How is it that these religious leaders can't even feel that they got sawdust in their eyes? But Jesus doesn't deal with that. Jesus just tells them, fine, you're a religious leader. You want to help the, the, the person. So in your brother's eye, you see this sawdust. But you are the religious leader, and you got a block of wood in yours. Now, if the sawdust can irritate the average person, and they were dealing with Jews then, and that person got sawdust, we have no complaint again that they said about the sawdust in their eye. Jesus doesn't say, okay, that they shouldn't get rid of the, help them get rid of the sawdust. His point is, but you got a block of wood. And if you got a block of wood, you need to remove that. Then you can see clearly to get the speck out your brother's eye. So if you got big problems in your eye and you see little problems in someone else, then get the big stuff out of you so you can be a blessing to somebody else. Give some hand claps up in there. Whenever we make ourselves better than others, instead of helping others, we isolate ourselves. Our president, oh no, I ain't saying a whole lot, I trust me, I done learned. After my Donald Trump mass a month and a half ago, you, I'm cool, I'm, I'm, I'm straight. <laughs> He's still the president, so much so some honor. But here's my point. He has adopted a policy, as most of you know, a policy that played, I personally believe, a key role in him getting elected. Well, what was that? That America isolates itself from everyone else. It's called isolationism. He's teaching to deal with all these external threats, we need to build walls. We don't deal with nobody else. We just stay in our own little world and tough on everybody else. But I'm here to tell you, I've learned that we must build bridges, not walls. If we are to be a blessing to others, we must find ways to connect people, to help people. Anybody can build a wall and separate yourself. It takes love and concern and empathy to build a bridge and reach out to somebody. The reality is that there are times in everyone's life when they need help to make it. How dare we refuse to help others? When if all of us would have any measure of humility, there were times when others stepped in and helped us. It's funny the things you remember when you're down. When I was unemployed for two years, I remember my best friend who passed on. I was sitting in church with him, and they passed the offering back. He, I had no money, nothing. He reached very privately and handed me a couple of dollars so I could put it in the basket because I was so ashamed I didn't have it. I remember Sister Ruby Beeler, who without me asking for anything, saw me one day and gave me $40. If you see your brother or sister have need, why they got to ask you? If you know that need is real and you know that need is genuine, there should be something in you that feels what your brother and sister need. Many of you 
And I say this to your commendation. Many of you have saved your families. Literally. There was job loss. You gave extended family members and, and immediate family members loans. Loans that you will never see again. I thought I'd get two, three people say, you know you're preaching now, Pastor. Keep <laughs> See, this ain't a shouting message today. We shouted last week. Y'all shouted all over the place. I hope somebody will cry today. Many of you saved your families. They lost their home. You took them in your house. And your house has never been the same again. Because, see, it, when you love somebody, it's not about that they inconvenience you. When you love somebody, it's about you do anything to sacrifice for them. And hear me this, you kids and all that think you're all grown. When people sacrifice for you, you owe them. Because they don't have to do it. They do it out of love. And the least you can do is show respect and honor to those who sacrifice. Talking about saving our family. I'm down to earth now. This I told you. Someone is in jail that's in your family. You raised their child. The story ain't even been told on a number of grandparents who thought they were through parenting. Am I preaching to you, Deloney? And now, they find themselves at an age and they think they're going to be chilling. Now they're raising. And again, it is a labor of love. But if you didn't have to do it, you wouldn't want to do it. Well, say, what you want to be doing? Cruising. As I rush on, the third type of burden is the one too big for anyone to handle without the Lord. Scripture says he won't put more on us than we can bear. First Peter 5 and 7 says, cast all your anxiety on him. In that Greek, cast has to do with just throw it. Don't, don't gently place it. Throw whatever it is that's got you. Throw it on him. For he cares for you. Peter took that passage from a psalm. Note the psalm. The psalm 55 puts it this way. Cast your cares on the Lord. And then what happens? He will sustain you. He will never let the righteous be shaken. Once again, when you put your cares on the Lord, he will keep you steady and he will take you through. I'm going to preach my message. You see, when we try to handle what we can't handle alone. Listen carefully. We are the ones who put more on us than we can bear, not the Lord. Did you catch that? And if you think you're too big as I wrap up to get some help, don't forget the same Jesus who helps us is the same Jesus who needed help carrying his cross. <laughs> Check that out. Jesus didn't look at Simon and say, I'm the son of God. You don't help me, I'll help you. You know, I'm going to do a little eisegesis here. Eisegesis is reading a little bit into the text. Exegesis, which is my primary way of teaching, is pulling out. That's how you stay on track with exegesis. It's Isaac Jesus that gives us all this bad doctrine. But I don't think I'm too far off if I make this comment. That if Simon hadn't helped Jesus, he couldn't have got to the cross. I don't think I'm too far off. Even the ungodly Roman soldiers could see that Jesus could go no further. And if you don't understand that, then watch the passion of the Christ. 
God intended, help us, Holy Spirit. God intended for Simon to be passing that way at that time. He didn't even know he was going to be a blessing. He didn't even know that he was going to carry the cross of his soon coming Savior. All he was was in the right place at the right time. Someone talk about it and call him the ram in the butcher. You see, if you're going to be a tool for God, you got to learn how to be in the right time, the right place, and watch what God can do. Simon didn't know, but God knew Jesus had to get to that cross. And so God put Simon, a black Jew, in the way to help him. And the thing that's amazing that blows me away is that Simon helped Jesus get to the cross so that Jesus could die for his sins on the cross. Yeah, Simon helped him get to the cross so that Jesus could die on the cross for Simon's sins and your sins and mine. I want five, ten praises to lift him up. Ikala. Jesus wore the crown of thorns so that you and I might wear the crown of glory. Do you hear me? Jesus wore the crown of thorns so that you and I might wear the crown of glory. Let me wrap this up. <laughs> Thank you for joining us today. And we look forward to worshiping with you at either our 9 a.m. or 11.30 a.m. Sunday services that are biblically based, illustrative, contemporary, and timely. Our services cater to men, women, the young, and young at heart. We also invite you to join us for Tuesday night Bible study at 7.45 p.m. and Lunch on the Word on Wednesdays at noon. We are so thankful for your continued support of this ministry. And if this excerpt from our service touched your heart to either give financially to the ministry or to purchase the entire worship service on either CD or DVD, please call 708-283-0383 or visit us online at www.victoryapostolicchurch.org. 